Uh, well, it, right now it's low, so historically says it'll be higher than where it is uh, today in a month. But uh, I think uh, you'll inc- I'll improve my chances if we say maybe three months from now, uh, looking forward to that fourth quarter. It usually is higher in that fourth quarter. Um, but yeah, uh, I, it's not going to change how I trade. I'm going to expect the market to be higher. Uh, if you give me a long period of time and while the market's going higher, I'm going to expect there to be a volat- volatility spikes and volatility uh, troughs. You're listening to IBKR Podcasts. Find more conversations at ibkrpodcasts.com. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Hi, everybody. This is Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist, and I want to welcome you all to this latest edition of the IBKR Podcasts. Today with me, we're going to have a discussion about volatility. My guests today are Joe Tigay, CTO of Equity Armor Investments, and Caitlin Meyer, VP at the Myax Exchanges. Um, and we're going to have um, hopefully a bit of a deep dive into some volatility and some volatility products and some strategies that uh, investors can use uh, in light of the current low volatility environment and whether or not it, it is likely to remain that way. So um, if each of you could just give like a, a quick 30 second intro to the, uh, to the listeners, please. Caitlin, you can go first. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve, for having me on first and foremost. It's good to be here with you guys. Uh, so as Steve said, I'm VP of Marketing and Sales at Myax and Really what I, I, my background has always been in the exchange space, you know, how do you look at products? How do you educate, um, you know, the end users on those? And specifically at MyX, as we have grown just from, you know, one options exchange, we now have three options exchanges, um, one equities exchange, a futures exchange, um, an international exchange in Bermuda. So, you know, a, a lot of things going on at MyX and, you know, my focus is, really educating that end user on the products that we have. So I know we'll get into it here shortly. As Steve said, you know, we're talking about volatility, um, but spikes and, you know, that innovative product coming into the market um, and what that can do and, and signal for you today. Thanks, Caitlin. Joe? Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, my name is Joe Tige. I am the portfolio manager at Equity Armor Investments. I am portfolio manager on two mutual funds, a rational equity armor fund and the catalyst hedged equity fund. Uh, I was a former uh, options market maker on the Chicago Board Options Exchange, early adapter, or one of the first uh, VIX options market makers. And I was also a uh, solo market maker in the S&P 500 pit. So uh, uh, my background is in options and volatility trading. And I'm happy to share that knowledge with uh, my current clients, which I do uh, portfolio management services and risk uh, risk management uh, for them. And I'm uh, happy to share that with you today. Thanks, Joe. Well. I'm going to start off, uh, and this is this is kind of an open question, but I think I'll start with you, Joe. With apologies to Monty Python's dead parrot, is volatility dead or is it simply resting? Uh, I would say it's simply resting. Volatility uh, is um, it's always there. It's just a calculation. If you say it's dead, uh, it's kind of a misunderstanding on what it's measuring and what it's doing. And to say that it's dead would be like saying, you know, calculus is dead or or something like that. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's simply a calculation on uh, on a, bun- a series of options contracts. You look at the the spider. You look spider ETF. You you have a, a strip of all the options calculations. You can uh, get a get a number back to you, and sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, and it's just basically supply and demand. So if you don't like if you don't like the price, um, you're welcome out there to go out and buy volatility and figure it's low. You're welcome to go out there to sell volatility out if you think it's high. Essentially, it's just a free market, and right now it happens to be low, so it's a summer month and people are just resting. But it's just uh, it's just an indicator of low. Uh, a uh, low price movements expected for the next 30 days. It's funny because when you said it's like calculus, it's just there. That, I, I've described it as being like oxygen. It's there um, and you kind of know when you have too much of it or too little of it. But for most of the time, it's just sort of in the background. Um, and that's why, you know, what a lot of people think of volatility as an asset class, it's tricky because you always have some exposure to volatility, just, just as there's always exposure to the air that we breathe. 
Um, and again, in our business, all, th all three of our businesses, volatility is to some extent the air that we breathe. Um, and so I, 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 I appreciate your thoughts on that by comparing it to calculus. Um, yeah, it, it, and, I, and I do think it's an asset class. You can actually go out and buy futures in it. It makes it a lot like a lot of other asset classes out there. But it's different than most of the asset classes that we think of. You, when you think of asset classes, I'm usually thinking of you know equities and real estate and gold and oil and currencies. These things you can hold, you can have, you can you can feel, you can see. Uh, most of the time you expect for, you know, bonds, uh, another example, you expect these to go up over time. You can buy and hold them with a long-term positive appreciation expectation. Volatility, it's, again, it's just a calculation. Uh, you can you can hold it in the future, but you can't necessarily grab onto it. You can't like put it in your pocket, um, but it's, and it doesn't have a long-term positive expected value. The difference for volatility for me is it's mean reverting. Uh, sometimes it's low and I expect it to be higher later uh, when it's low and sometimes it's high. When it's high, I expect it to come back down. Well, that, that's kind of, I think we're along the same lines. That's why when I picked a form of matter, I picked a gas because you can't actually necessarily hold it, but, but it is in fact matter and it's pervasive. Um, in terms of the mean reversion, are we, where do you feel the mean is right now? Yes. Yeah, so since COVID, it's been higher. Uh, it's been higher than it had been before. Um, historically, um, you know, we're on the lower end of the side. Right now, uh, we have, you know, spikes under 14, or spikes are actually under 13 and a half. So it's, uh, it's very low. It's a, more than a three-year low for volatility levels. So um, that, is, that, is low, that is lower <laughs> than the mean. Uh, I usually look at the 252, like a, a one-year trading average uh, for, for my mean. Uh, and typically, it, looks, it, it wants to trend back to the mean uh, for that. So right now, we are um, decidedly on the low end of the, of the mean for me. And that, you know, by, by bringing up spikes, that leads into, you know, a question that I think is, is certainly one that, that I, I wanted to address to Caitlin, and that is, tell us more about spikes. Tell us more about that complex, um, you know, and, and some of the use cases that our listeners might find for it. Yeah, you know, Joe's been talking about it a little bit, um, so I'll give him a plug for some of his content that he's writing, but... You know, spikes is just another indicator. So no different than, you know, some of the one indexes out there. You can't trade those. Um, so spikes itself is a 30-day expected um, measure of volatility um, in the S&P 500. So, you know, you have VIX out there. Many people are familiar with that product. You know, spikes was developed um, by a guy named Simon Ho um, from T3 indexes. Is basically a, a what he thinks and what I do is a, a better way to measure volatility. So, you know, we have VIX that uses SPX options, Spikes uses SPY options. Um, you know, when you look at the two indices side by side, you know, they're measuring the exact same thing. As you start to look at the products, they're 99% correlated, um, but some key differences. So, you know, I know we'll get into those. I, I do want to say, you know, for those that look up, these indices, um, obviously, those aren't tradable. So on the spikes index, you have, you know, a complex, as Steve talked about. You got options that you can trade. You have futures. Um, there's ETFs, um, SPKX, SPKY. And these just give you a way to, to know, to Joe's point earlier of, you know, what's, what's your view on volatility? Um, so now you have tradable products that you're able to do that with. So key differences as you look between, you know, everyone, you know, can pull up VIX, you look at options, futures, again, you have those um, on spikes as well. But with the index itself, you know, key differences, you know, SPX um, is the input for VIX, but SPY options, you know, those are traded on all exchanges. Those are the inputs that are used for spikes. And, and one of the key things that I think we think that that's a better index is, um, you know, you're, you're using a lot more inputs um, from all the different exchanges. So that helps with any differences, um, you know, particularly in key events, FOMC meetings, when there might be, you know, less prices going on, bid S and, and SPX. Um, there's a price dragging methodology used in spikes that will kind of 
mitigate any of those kind of erratic differences that can come into play. Thanks, Caitlin. And, and we will get into some of the compare and contrast a little bit a little bit later on in, in the in the episode. Um, but you know, I, I reading the Wall Street Journal the other day, um, and just so you just for everybody knows, we're taping this on June twenty eighth. This probably comes out uh, a little bit later, just because of uh, you know some internal production and stuff like that. Um, but they had a they had a big article that the stock market isn't as calm as it seems. Um, and, you know, to me, one of the most interesting points in that article was correlations within stocks haven't been this low since late 2017 and early 2018. Um, for those of us who've been in the options market for a while, those are very auspicious dates because we all remember what happened in February of 2018, which was Volmageddon. Um, two questions, and you can... I'll throw this out to either of you, and you can answer it in any way you want. Number one, um, do you feel that, that that we're sort of setting up for the potential for a big move in volatility? A la, not necessarily Volmageddon by any means, but I don't want to be alarmist. But do you feel like we're setting up for, that, for a big move? Do you feel like we're setting up for just a continuation of this? Um, and secondly, um, if we do get a Volmageddon event, um, will it be better, better, worse, or 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 no different by the uh, popularity of zero DTE options? So there's a lot in that question, and I I I have my opinions, but I want to I, I want uh, I want to get both of your opinions on these. I'll start with the first one, Joe, and I think it goes back to what you said earlier. You know, is volatility dead? No, I, I don't think it is. So as you think, is there something brewing? It, you know, maybe, maybe not. As you know, with volatility, you know, you can never predict the future, but it is mean reverting. As you look at history, you know, you see what happens. You have spikes and then it comes back down. Um, no plug on spikes there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you'll see it. It's very low. You look, it's going back to February of 2020. So if we go back to, you know, history, you know, there is going to be an increase at some point. What that is, you know, I don't think any of us on this knows, um, nor does the market. But, you know, with the amount of increase, I think, you know, Steve, into the zero DTE options, which seems to be such a hot topic lately, you know, has that changed things that people are looking at? And um, there's a lot, I think, to unpack. Um, you know, we're still going through, you know, maybe potentially new interest rates coming out. Stuff is happening. Um, that will take time, I think, for the market. And as people are starting to and you'll see that in the data of, you know, I think in that article that you mentioned, Steve, there's something about the the call options going on and, and volatility um, products. So, you know, I think people are starting to assume that there, there will be an increase at some point when I don't I don't think any of us. Obviously, if we knew the answer to that, um, we'd be a lot richer than we are. And one thing, before I throw it over to Joe, I just want to remind everybody that just as February 18 was a very auspicious date, so was February 2020, because we all know what happened in March of that year. Um, and and yet at that point in February of 2020, there were rumors of a, more than rumors, news stories of a of a virus that was taking taking root in in China. So markets don't always don't always see what's about to hit them. Sorry, Doe. I didn't mean. I didn't mean yeah, to. Uh, no, didn't mean to no steal that, that, that point. That was uh, really good information. Yeah, I remember February 18 very well. Uh, long volatility trader. Uh, we had a, a book of futures back then, and um, that was a very memorable day for us. Uh, February 5th, 2018. Remember, remember <laughs> the 5th of November. Uh, yeah, we wound up having to sell uh, 60 million notional on the close of uh, futures, which were just you know, one of the most fantastic feelings, but it was it, it was similar actually to 2020 because there were the stories of the virus in 2020. Uh, there were stories about um, there's record short short interest in uh, in some of these uh, AT, ATNs. Uh, there's record uh, record uh, positioning going on here. So uh, that was very interesting. Now, going back to the first part of your question, that article, uh, the the um, the correlations to me, volatility correlations are very very tied together. Remember these indexes are are these these uh, volatility indexes are to, with 
uh, equity indexes. So uh, when you have uh, correlations low, you can have days where one part of the market is up, one part of the market is down, and then the market's actually flat. We're seeing a lot of that lately. Uh, that That's uh, correlated with low volatility. So uh, that's that's one of the reasons why uh, the market's so low is we're getting rotations. We're getting into value, into growth, back in and out. Um, you know, there's a week when uh, regional banks get hammered, then the next week the regional banks uh, take off again. Uh, so that's that's all that's all to me. And uh, but one of the risks I see with that is that, yes, uh, most of the rally in 2023 are in the top seven or so S&P 500 names. Uh, they are uh, maybe forming a little bit of a bubble, some might say. Uh, it's not necessarily for me to say that because sometimes uh, the market can remain ir irrational longer than that. the short sellers can remain solvent. So um, that's that's one component of it. Uh, but that to me sets up a little bit of a risk when you see that concentration of the gains. Uh, and then getting back to the, um, the, the zero DTE, uh, is that setting up um, a volatility again and I don't think it's necessarily similar and I do think the risks for a big pop in the VIX or spikes uh, is significantly higher when it's lower uh, for starters so we're kind of at that point but uh, to get a volume again in type of uh, event you there was kind of a uh, trip line on some of these ETNs I don't think they exist in the same way with the zero D DTE it does, however, set up things similar to me, more like a flash crash or, or something like that, where there is a potential catalyst where we reach a, a, a level uh, and then it, it you kind of can get it unwinding. So there is uh, there's more more parallels to me to a flash crash event uh, where you know volatility might not be, go unhinged, but you might see some big market uh, market moves. Well, I, I I tend to agree because we, we've seen this where volatility indices can can lay low for a long period of time. And I remember in 2018 having a discussion with with a, a long term options guy who long long term meaning his career, um, and he was telling me why he was you know shorting VIX at, at whatever at like 11. You know why vol was a sale with with VIX at like 11 or something like that. And I, I basically said you're insane. Um, we tended to, when we were options market makers, we tended to be the odd ones that we traded from a long volatility point of view. So um, I, I, I too have somewhat fond memories of Volmageddon. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, the, the, the problem is also the more, so what we've learned a couple of things is that, that you know, we, I, they say markets take the stairs to the to the attic and the and the elevator to the basement, but volatility tends to do the opposite. So it, it tends to take the stairs to the basement and the elevator to the roof, and and that's kind of the problem you have if you think you're going to jump in um, and, and and catch volatility right. It's very hard to do. Think about in early May, which was essentially really a, a not particularly interesting time. There was an FOMC meeting. We started the week at 15 and a half. And we were at 21 and a half by like Thursday. Um, things mm -hmm. move quickly. Then it goes back down. You know, then it then it all settles back down. Um, you know, the other thing from the from the you know from the systemic risk point of view is the the people who I think use the term you know who who worry about the the systemic risk from zero DTE options um, the you know, is sort of inversely proportional to their time spent as a professional options market maker, risk manager, clearer, clearing person, exchange person, et cetera. Um, you know, both of you, I, I, I've, I've compared zero DTE options to a casino opening up a new table. You know, okay, so this is, we, we've, you know, we've always had the $10 tables, now we've opened the $5 tables. Um, but there's really nothing fundamentally different in the in the in the risks or the or, or the games that have been played, um, options have been. We've had zero DTE options for as long as we've had options because they every D, every option is eventually a zero DTE option, um, and you know and, and I know that some of the folks at OCC who have spent a lifetime in the clearing of options and risk management of options generally share this viewpoint. Do you guys do you guys feel? Am, am I barking up the wrong tree here, or do you think I, I'm, I'm sort of in the right place? I think you're 100% right. Uh, 
like every expiration Friday for as, as long as options have been around have been a, has been a zero TD. And then there's been uh, weeklies for a very long time. So, um, it yeah, I 100% right. I think I love that analogy, actually, just opening up another table. Um, it's another spot um, for uh for you know, traders, uh, I'm sure uh, day traders like it because they have uh, more options um, <laughs> available to them. Yeah. Uh, no pun intended. So, um, I, yeah, I think that's 100 percent right. I don't think it does create any new uh, systemic risk. Um, yeah, it, it's just it's just more more trading, more volumes. Um, the exchanges like it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would just add. You know, it goes back to you know. 100% agree. Just more education, though, too. I think we saw it during the pandemic of new people coming into our markets. You know, the accessibility, you know, we all have phones, we all trade off of them. So now you just have more, more optionality when you can trade. Um, so just making sure, you know, for all those that are interested in these, making sure that you're educated on, on you know, how they work. Because, you know, if there is some type of huge volatility event, you know, making sure that you understand the implications of of those. But I don't think to any point of, you know, both of you are correct. We've had these forever. That's what everyone's been saying. There's not a change from that standpoint. It's just you now you have a lot more to think about it and to play, um, not play, but, you know, trade every day. Yeah, new, you new tools, you know, yeah, exactly. um, speaking of tools, um, Caitlin, can you compare and contrast some of the tools that are available um, you, refer you referenced, um, you know, the futures, you referenced the options, you referenced the ETFs. In full disclosure, I happen to be long SPKX right now um, because, uh, as you can tell from this discussion, I think I'd rather be long vol than short vol. Um, and that's one of the ways I've expressed it. Not a big position, by the way, but I've wanted to dip my toe in and, and try them out. Uh, but can you, um, can you, you know, go through some of the, some of the, 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 the rationale behind these products, and let me state very clearly, these are not ETNs, and, I, and I've written about this before. ETNs are a credit instrument. They just look, they're, they're a bond, they're issued by a creditor. They're not, they're not issued by a clearinghouse. They're essentially cleared, but they're very different. Um, and so let me just start by saying these are not the type of ETNs that Joe was referring to that got people into trouble. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, Steve. Um, I think volatility, you know, as an as an asset class is in itself, you know, as Joe talked about, is something that has been taking off in the in the marketplace overall. And as often as I say, as you could be trading, you know, gold or crude, you know, this is just another tool in kind of your toolkit, if you would, as you think about volatility products overall. So it's diversification. And as you think about, you know, for many of us that are trading equities, you know, maybe you have SPY, um, this gives you a way to hedge, you know. So mm -hmm. say, you know, at some point, you know, there could be a change and, you know, we no longer have a, a fully up market, um, you know, spikes or other volatility products because it is, you know, inverse really related to the S&P allows you to kind of hedge that perspective. So I know Joe was to talk about some strategies here in a second, but I think that's an important point um, to call out is why people look at spikes or, or volatility, um, just in addition to what else they're trading. And to that point, you know, as you think about spikes, you know, again, a measure of the S&P 500 um, volatility, you know, it does use SPY options. So that's why we've seen a lot of traders looking at this product because they are trading you know, spy, um, and it just allows them to hedge in another manner. Um, and, and functionality of, of different products. So some people like, you know, options, some people are trading futures, you know, having, you know, ETFs on this index allows you the choice. Um, so that's why I'm, you know, passionate about, you know, spikes just providing the marketplace choice in terms of another product when they're looking to trade volatility, you know, lower exchange fees, um, which is often important that we look at, but it it also gives you the choice of the type of product that you're trading. Um, whether you want to be, you know, to Steve, your point, you could be trading ETFs, so the SBKX, which is a one-time um, measure, or the one and a half times is SPKY. So, 
that you gave uh, Mr. T. Gay a perfect segue. Um, sorry to torture that rhyme, but Joe, how are some of the ways that you're utilizing volatility products in your um, in your trading and your portfolio management? Yeah, so um, you know this is a strategy that I developed and uh, my team developed as options market makers in the VIX pit, and we um, you know we identified that. Uh, most people um, think of options and they think think of big volatility futures, spikes futures, big futures. They think, oh, that's super risky. Uh, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, uh, there's actually two sides to that coin. They can make uh, things riskier. They can also make things uh, less risky. Um, that's uh, where we where we step into volatility trading. We use it to make investing in the market less risky. Uh, and we hold volatility, uh, express it with a long volatility. Uh, we hold long volatility with the uh, with the goal of getting market returns um, on a smoother path. So we use uh, the the exact way that I described the VIX before, uh, I expect it sometimes it'll be cheap, sometimes it'll be expensive, um, and it'll always trade, not always, very highly negatively tra correlated trade against the market. So when the market is lower, volatility is higher. When the, the market's higher, volatility is lower. So we hold two uh, components to a portfolio, uh, and then we rebalance daily. So we have an equity component, uh, and that can be either you know tech stocks like we have in our our Catalyst Hedge Equity Fund, or we can have you know just a a, a large cap portfolio like we have in our Rational Fund, uh, and then we can daily rebalance. So uh, we have it's essentially a long short, but they're both long long stocks, long volatility, um, where um, we're we're getting the benefit of that appreciation over time, which I expect with uh, the equities. Um, we have that long-term hold, long-term bias there. And then we're getting uh, that that smoothing out of that. Um, and we're getting the, the benefit of while these stocks are going higher over time, uh, there's going to be volatility events. There's going to be corrections in the market. So uh, in an event like 2020, when there's a big uh, pop in volatility, we're going to have a much lower drawdown, which obviously is what we achieved. Um, and we're able to capitalize on that gain in volatility. We're able to sell volatility when it's high, and then we can use those proceeds and actually buy stocks back, which are cheaper. Uh, it's very important to trade it that way. That uh, is actually, it's kind of like using futures, but kind of gamma trading it. Uh, if you're, any of your listeners are, are familiar with gamma trading, uh, we're able to, to have like a free gamma trade uh, by just holding two components to our portfolio. Uh, we're trading the volatility back and forth um, and holding holding our equities uh, to get that long-term appreciation. That is a very simple and elegant strategy in a way. And, uh, clearly, I'm not the first person you've explained this to, um, <laughs> nor are our <laughs> listeners, but that, but that is a very elegant way of thinking about it. I really appreciate it. You know, I, I'm looking at, I'm looking at my, I keep a little timer here. We managed to blow through the time allotted to us. Uh, there is no real set time limit, but boy, we, we covered a lot of ground in, in what it seemed to me to be a short period of time. Um, you know, I guess any, any final thoughts uh, before we wrap up from either, well, for both of you? Caitlin, you can go first. No, I appreciate being on the, on with you both. I think it'll be interesting um, to see, you know, as we look at where volatility is now, I'd love us to see what it is in a month if we connect again. Okay. Um, so I'll let Joe give us, give his guess on that. <laughs> uh, well, it, right now it's low, so historically it says it'll be higher than where it is uh, today in a month. But uh, I think uh, you'll inc I'll improve my chances if we say maybe three months from now, uh, looking forward to that fourth quarter. It usually is higher in that fourth quarter. Um, but yeah, uh, I, it's not going to change how I trade. I'm going to expect the market to be higher. Uh, if you give me a long period of time and while the market's going higher, I'm going to expect there to be a volat volatility spikes and volatility uh, troughs. What an awesome way to end. I, I'm not, I'm not going to attempt to top those. So uh, let me leave it <laughs> at that. I want to thank once again uh, my guests, Joe Tigay of uh, CTO of Equity Armor Investments, Caitlin Meyer, VP of Marketing at MyAx. And uh, this is Steve Sosnick, Chief Strategist at Interactive Brokers. Thank you once again. Uh, you could find all our podcasts at ibkrpodcast.com uh, and wherever you find your uh, podcasts, whether it's uh, Apple, Google, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and 
Thanks once again to my guests, and thanks one thanks once again to all of you listeners uh, for sticking through with us. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. Thanks for listening to IBKR Podcasts. As always, we have more episodes at ibkrpodcast.com. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com. We offer more trading education material, such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, financial and economic commentary at tradersinsight.news, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and is necessary, seek professional advice. Options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. For more information, read the characteristics and risks of standardized options, or ODD, which may be accessed through the link found in the show's notes or podcast description page. Any discussion or mention of an ETF is not to be construed as recommendation, promotion, or solicitation. All investors should review and consider associated investment risks, charges, and expenses of the investment company or fund prior to investing. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, as necessary, seek professional advice. Futures are not suitable for all investors. The amount you may lose may be greater than your initial investment. Before trading futures, please read the CFTC Risk Disclosure. A copy and additional information are available at ibkr.com. Alternative investments can be highly illiquid or speculative and may not be suitable for all investors. Investing in alternative investments is only for experienced and sophisticated investors who have a high risk tolerance. Investors should carefully review and consider potential risks before investing. Significant risks may include but are not limited to the loss of all or a portion of an investment due to leverage, lack of liquidity, volatility of returns, restrictions on transferring of interests in a fund, lower diversification, complex tax structures, reduced regulation, and higher fees. Mutual funds are investments that pool the funds of investors to purchase a range of securities to meet specified objectives such as growth, income, or both. Investors are reminded to consider the various objectives, fees, and other risks associated with investing in mutual funds. IBKR does not solicit you to invest in specific funds and does not recommend specific funds or any other products to you. For additional information, view our mutual fund product listings. The interviewer participating in this podcast episode is a board member of MIAX, Miami International Holdings, Inc. While the interviewer's role at MIAX grants them insights into the financial industry and the exchange's operations, it is important to clarify that his involvement with MIAX does not create any conflict of interest regarding the content and discussions presented in this podcast episode.